Story continued from Ceratosaurus Kingdom Playlist. Night has fallen over the late Jurassic forests and floodplains, but darkness does not stop predators from hunting. For many, this is when they awaken, to stalk beneath the moonlight. Medium-sized predators especially come out at night to avoid running into the large carnivores that do most of their hunting during the day. One such predator is Marshosaurus. This 4.5 meter hunter is far smaller than some of the other carnivores it lives alongside, such as Allosaurus and Torvosaurus. So it scavenges off of those it can't hope to fight, and targets small prey in the dense forests. Tonight, a female Marshosaurus is looking for a meal. She can see very well in the low light thanks to her large eyes. But to track prey, she relies on her keen sense of smell. Tonight, she has picked up the scent of hatched eggs. Following her nose, she soon comes across the nest that once housed the eggs. They hatched a few days ago, the mother having broken open the nest and taken her hatchling somewhere else. The Marshosaurus began to follow the scent the mother and chicks left in their wake, confident they didn't get too far, but aware that the species she was tracking was a dangerous one. She was tracking for a long time, but as she followed the trail, the mother's scent was all over the place. This was clearly an area that she had visited frequently. As a result, she couldn't pinpoint where she had left her young, or if she was still guarding them. Uncertain if staying here was too big a risk, she prepares to start hunting elsewhere, when a small squeak catches her attention. She goes completely still, and listens intently in the sound's direction. Sure enough, another squeak cuts through the forest, and suddenly the Marshosaurus is back on the trail. Now following her ears, it isn't long until she finds the newly hatched dinosaurs she has been looking for. Moving her head around a tree, she sees a small group of infant, Allosaurus. Their mother had brought them away from the nest and had placed them in thick therns where they could hide when she or their father wasn't around to guard them. A good strategy, but some of the hatchlings obviously didn't realize how many dangers were in this forest. And though some were hiding while their parents were away, a few were playing together, chirping and squeaking without a care in the world. They had no idea this carelessness would be their deaths. The Marshosaurus lowered herself and began to steadily move towards the infant Allosaurus that couldn't see her in the darkness. Despite her weighing 200 kilograms, her footsteps are almost silent, and she takes extra care to glide across any leaves or ferns in a way that make little noise. Closer and closer she stalks. She covers so much ground, and yet none of the playing youngsters notice her, until one of them pulls away from the group, looks into the forest, and notices the slight shimmer of two eyes. The Marshosaurus bolts forward. The first Allosaurus doesn't even have time to register what is happening, before the female's jaws snap shut around his body, killing him in a flash. With one secured in her mouth, she continues running, and goes right into the center of the playing group, she snatches up a second juvenile in her fingers, holding it close to her body, the long claws on her hands piercing the hatchling, preventing any chance of escape. The same moment she picked up a second victim, the rest of the infants scattered in all directions, running and squealing in terror, as the trap youngsters screamed in horror and pain. The Marshosaurus ignored the fleeing Allosaurus and the loud one that kicked and squirmed in her embrace and instead concentrated on throwing the dead hatchling in her jaws back down her throat and swallowing it whole. She had a firm grip on the second infant, and so began to look for more to snatch up in her jaws, but a sickening growl ripped through the cool night air, a sound the Marshosaurus recognized. It seemed the mother wasn't that far away. Looking over her shoulder, her keen eyesight picked out the unmistakable figure of a full-grown Allosaurus, marching through the forest with a rage only a vengeful mother could conjure. Still holding the young Allosaurus in her hands, the Marshosaurus bolted away from the incoming adult Allosaurus. She didn't look back, but she could feel its footfalls reverberate through the earth, and she heard the sinister growl again, but this time much closer. The Allosaurus was larger, had a longer stride, and was faster in a sprint, but in the confines of the forest, 
the Marshosaurus was far more at home than the two-ton Allosaurus. She ducked under a fallen tree, weaved through ferns, jumped over rocks, her agility keeping her ahead of the raging Allosaurus. She kept running even as she heard the mother smash her head through a low-lying branch and keep pursuing her. All the time the infant was crying out, so the Marshosaurus, while running for her life, lifted the tiny Allosaur up and bit down, killing it swiftly. Soon after, the mother Allosaurus broke off the chase, no longer able to track its stolen young. The Marshosaurus kept running, however, keen to get to a neighboring territory. The last thing she heard from the Allosaurus was a defeated snarl. Story continued after the facts section of the video. Hello fellow travelers and welcome back. Today we will be breaking down one of the rare medium-sized predators from the Morrison Formation, Marshosaurus. Unlike many of the more famous dinosaurs from the Morrison Formation, Marshosaurus was not found during the tumultuous time known as the Bone Wars, which happened in the late 19th century. Instead, the first remains were discovered during expeditions in the 1960s, where over 14,000 fossil bones were uncovered at the Cleveland Lloyd Quarry in central Utah. In 1976, some of the remains of a medium-sized theropod were given the name Marshosaurus by James Henry Madsen Jr. It was named after Othniel Charles Marsh, who was one of the key figures in the Bone Wars. Multiple individuals have been assigned to Marshosaurus, however each is only known from fragmentary remains. Known parts of the skeleton include vertebra, arm bones, pelvis bones, pubic bones, foot bones, jaw fragments, and some other poorly preserved bones. It lived in Utah and Colorado during the late Jurassic period between 155 and 152 million years ago. In 2010, Gregory S. Paul used the limited remains to estimate Marshosaurus could grow up to 4.5 meters long, stand 1.2 meters high at the hip, and weigh up to 200 kilograms. However, some estimates have put it as large as 6 meters. After much debate, Marshosaurus was eventually placed in the Megalosauridae family, more specifically in the Piatnistosauridae subfamily, a group that includes Piatnistosaurus itself, and Condor Raptor. Unfortunately, that's the majority of what we know about Marshosaurus. So let's talk about what role it may have filled in its environment. The Morrison Formation is famous for sauropod remains, including famous species like Diplodocus, Apatosaurus, and Brachiosaurus. There were other herbivores as well, such as Stegosaurus, Dryosaurus, and Camptosaurus. The reason we find more remains of the larger species is because in general larger bones break down slower and are more likely to fossilize in the right conditions. So just like today, the smaller fauna would have surely outnumbered the larger species many times over. Some of the other predators include the small Stokesosaurus, the similarly sized Ceratosaurus, and the much larger Torvosaurus and Saurophaganax. Of course, we have Allosaurus as well, whose remains make up around 70% of the theropods found in the Morrison Formation. So while it's likely Allosaurus was a common predator, we must remember the fossil record is a record of what died where, not how the ecosystem was throughout time. The mass of Allosaurus remains is likely due to preservation bias, such as them dying in areas that preserve them better than other species. Now let's use some modern comparatives for our Morrison predators. If Allosaurus are the lions of the Jurassic, and Ceratosaurus are the hyenas, then the mighty Torvosaurus and Saurophaganax are the equivalent to large bears. Marshosaurus at its largest was similar in size to Ceratosaurus, so a decent comparison may be that of a modern leopard. Not the biggest or strongest, but still a dangerous predator in its own right that fills its own niche. If they worked in packs, they may have filled the same role as grey wolves or painted wolves today. It likely hunted medium-sized prey like the Dryosaurus or juvenile sauropods, of which there may have been plenty. One cannot overlook the role scavenging played in these medium-sized carnivores' lives, and I don't just mean taking from other predators' kills. I mean the huge amount of food that would have been provided when one of these large sauropods they lived alongside died. 
A Diplodocus that weighed 25 tons could feed numerous predators for weeks. Brachiosaurus may have weighed up to 40 tons, which could feed countless scavengers for months. These would be the terrestrial equivalent to a whale fall, providing ample resources whenever these giants fell. And Marshasaurus would have been one of the many predators to benefit. Overall, Marshasaurus gives us a better picture of what the lower rungs of the food chain in the Morrison look like. Though we don't have a large amount of its remains, its mere discovery is another piece in the biological puzzle. But what do you think of Marshasaurus? And for my question of the week, do you agree with my rough comparison between the Morrison predators and our modern day ones? Or do you have a different allegory? What lesser known dinosaur would you like me to do a breakdown on next? And until then, please like, share, subscribe, and enjoy the second part of the narrative section. The next morning, the Marshasaurus is looking for a place to sleep after a successful night of hunting. She has moved out of the Allosaurus territory and into the neighboring Ceratosaurus territory, ruled by a scar-faced individual. She usually didn't come here, as the Ceratosaurus also hunted at night, and they were considerably more powerful than her. But she needed to stay away from the mother Allosaurus' territory, lest she come looking for revenge. She found a suitable spot to rest and lay down, but she couldn't shake the feeling that something was watching her. Raising her head, she slowly scanned the area, and soon was staring into the eyes of a large Ceratosaurus. It was her, the Scarred Face Queen. She was a fair distance away, but was staring right at her. Both carnivores were still as statues. Was she hunting her? Did she see her as competition? The atmosphere was tense and freakishly silent, but then the Ceratosaurus sniffed the air and narrowed her gaze on the Marshasaurus. It was then the smaller dinosaur noticed she still had some blood on her jaws from when she ate the two young Allosaurus. That had to be what the larger predator had detected. She wondered what the large female was going to do. But at that moment, the Ceratosaurus's face curled and flexed. Into for their species, what could be classed as a smile. In that moment, the Marshasaurus felt something completely foreign to her. What it felt like to be praised by a more powerful predator.